Já se tím chystám k tým mám a já je moc víc. Um, so thanks for coming back. Um, the second part of the workshop where you were, um, we actually give you the QR code um, so you can scan that and they'll give you the course plan for the life jacket, the Kota. Um, and they'll um, you know, explain you how to use this with your students. And you also see that we've placed it um, on your table. So you guys have the access to that now. So that's your prize for being willing to come back for more. So thanks for being here for both halves. We have lots of times time for questions. Uh, but first we have a moment of humility, which is that if you are quickly opening the course plan, you'll see that it's not done. <laughs> uh, that's because um, I, I was really trying to clean it up, take all of our notes off of it, and just make it nice and clear. And um, you, Machete Shakomi folks, are so friendly. I haven't quite finished doing it yet, because I keep getting, getting busy talking. Um, so by tonight, it will be completely cleaned up and ready for you. So that's why it's a live link, so that you can go to it later, and it will be updated. It will always update for you. And I will also put um, hyperlinks in there, Anything that's blue, you know, it's a hyperlink. And you can see the visual that we made. Um, if we made, you know, a poster or a game that the students used, which we had to do a lot of when we were on Zoom, uh, everything had to be clickable. So um, a lot of the stuff will be hyperlinked, and you can use it as it is. Um, so, it, uh, so it looks a little ugly now, but it's almost there, okay? So that would make some shock. <laughs> Um, so I'll just explain a little bit about how to use that if you wanted to teach this exact course. So uh, for folks who might not have been hearing the first session, the, the point of the life jacket course, it has that nickname of life jacket. The point is to prepare them for immersion, right? Keep them afloat in immersion. And so if you, so we imagine that they're going into a classroom that's going to be no English, going to be totally not put up, and they're going to be doing projects together, land-based learning together, where they're going to be um, active learning, group work, and so we asked what kind of language will they need to know in order to know what's going on in that classroom, and in order to ask their key questions, like how do I say this, what does this mean, uh, how to complain to the teacher, especially for kiddos, to say, he's not helping, he's hitting me, uh, can I go to the bathroom, right? All those things that we know they're gonna need to say the first day in that classroom, we wanted them to be ready to do it in the language so that they would not feel that the language is too hard for them to speak, they would feel confident. So there's a big emphasis on confidence and use, speaking, actually producing the language, not just only understanding. Of course, they're always gonna understand more than they can speak, but we want them to speak. And so uh, the idea is to use only 10 or 20 lessons. Um, so you could have them for four weeks or even two weeks and get them to the point where they'd be ready for that classroom. The video that we saw in the first session where we showed how successful they were when they went, they started at pretty much zero and where they ended up, that was with only 10 lessons for most of them. That was half of the course. So all things are possible. but. Um, the tw uh, if you can do 20 lessons, it's better because they, they don't forget as much. They get more repetition and they remember. Like some folks are already saying, what was that Armenian word you taught us earlier, right? So you need more, <laughs> you need more repetition. So um, the 20, 20 lesson version um, gets them a little bit stronger. But that way within one month, you can take somebody who's never heard the language before and have them ready for immersion. So if you would uh, like to use this plan, which has been developed over a, about three or four years uh, and m multiple student groups, you saw in the video how many different groups we've been working with, um, we've been re refining it and we will continue refining it each time we learn how to do something better. Um, so this is for you to take and of course, many of you have a different dialect, so you'd want to change the dialect that you use, and um, you can make any changes 
that you want. Um, the reason we give you the link is so that you can print it out if you want to, of course. But on Google Drive, when you um, when you go to that link, either you type it in or you use the QR, you'll get to same place. <clears throat> At the top of Google Drive, you can click File and then Make a Copy. And when you make a copy, the copy that you make is yours, only yours. It stays in your Google Drive, so you can take it and make it your own. Um, and also, of course, we would love your feedback, um, especially if you catch our mistakes or if you have suggestions for how we can improve it, please do tell us. So I'll just point out um, a couple of key ideas about the course plan. This is kind of what it looks like. Don't worry about trying to read it up there, but when you go to the, to the web page, you'll see that it has these different rows and columns. Actually, maybe I'll show. Um, and this is very different than you would usually see um, than you would usually see uh, see if I can get it to be bigger. Um, yeah. Then you would usually see like a textbook or something written. This is a different way. So I'll explain a little bit about how it is. So we start out with some of our notes, um, some things that we've learned share those with you. And then some links to things we've created, we will be updating them. So if you keep the link, you'll get updated versions. The calendar is what you saw us creating in that video where we were seeing what tasks are they gonna be able to do in what day. And then from there we plan backwards to make sure they will be ready to do that task at that day. And we were emphasizing that the whole idea is that they need to be successful <laughs> when they do it, right? We don't just throw a challenge at them and watch them fail and say, ha, ah, you couldn't do it. We get them really, 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 really ready. And then we give them the challenge and then they experience, ha, ah, I did that. And that builds the confidence. And if they can't, of course, some people are more ready than others. We just help, we just offer, we remind them. We don't say, oh, you failed, you couldn't do it. We just help, we remind them. If if a lot of them struggle, then we know we have to go back and teach it better. So we mostly are like grading ourselves more than we're grading them. If we gave it to them with function, form, frequency, and feedback, those four Fs, if they got those four Fs, they would be able to do it. If they weren't able to do it, they couldn't remember the words, or they said them really, really wrong, then we didn't give them the four Fs. And we have to go back and do it better. So this is the overall calendar, and then there's lessons. Sorry. Okay. So just to explain, this is what actually happens on day one. This is the language that they learn. We give them something that they can look at ahead of time if they want to. Usually the learners are really excited and they want to do something before the class. We don't make it required, but we usually offer it. And we usually have a website where they can go every day and click on it. I like to use Padlet for that. If any of you have used Padlet or Trello are really good websites. Or if you, if you work at a university and they have Canvas or something, um, that way they know I go to this web page and my class is there. And so I want to know what we're going to learn today. So I go and I click on the thing and I can watch a video of what we're going to learn today. And that gives them more frequency, more repetition. And then we always do a, an opening activity where we acknowledge each and every person. So you saw Rainy naming each person and greeting them and asking them some questions. And each day it gets more complicated. And that's a way that we make them feel welcome, which is an important point. We make them feel welcome and seen. We make sure that they know that they're going to be expected to participate every day. We're going to talk to you and ask you to answer us every day. And, um, and we practice the language we learned yesterday at that time. So they get that repetition. Every, if we, yesterday we learned how to say, so that means today we're going to say, oh, rainy. 
Yeah. Anybody to win, which is great. I usually stop it before they can win anyway. 
And also, it's not a competition. Language isn't a competition. We're here to help each other. So we do it like it's a game, but we're pretending it's a game. Um, and everybody encourages one another, and everybody um, roots for one another, helps one another find the answer. Um, I have I actually even had, um, that was another one of the groups that you had, but I have actually had like a 35-year-old language teacher like have a meltdown because her team did not win the fly swatter game where you hit the word with the fly swatter. And I thought, this is why we don't have winners. <laughs> because that is not the point. So I don't like to do anything competitive personally. Maybe once they're better and they're more confident, you can have an occasional competition. But for the most part, they're just, they're a game, but we're all just helping each other. So. All right, let's make everybody uncomfortable, shall we? immersion is that we don't use English to help students understand. So we need lots of non-verbal non cues, uh, facial expressions, um, body movements, and you know, um, it's better if the, the staff, they have a word to go with the action, it kind of wires it in their head a little bit more. So, um, uh, I was explaining to Anka one time <laughs> that being this kind of personality isn't like my personality. Like if people know me, I'm pretty chill, like I'm in a observe situation and I get, you know, like warm up to the room. But as a teacher, wanting to convey language just doesn't really work for me. I have to be a little bit extra. Especially around elders, <laughs> no, it's not that way. <laughs> but you know, like this whole idea of teaching is for you guys. Like, so I'm gonna make myself uh, act a little bit crazy because I want you guys to feel a little bit okay. Let's act crazy. <laughs> um, and so I'm not gonna say, oh, I expect you all to do this if I'm not gonna participate too. So um, right now we're gonna just have a little practice doing this. Um, so um, we're going to just need, what? We can hurt everyone in the chairs and then we can just have volunteers. So there's going to be volunteers even more. Okay, so there's, there's going to be volunteers. So if you feel <laughs> in your heart that you want to volunteer, just start thinking about it. But we're going to just start off as a group in your chairs. And so you give us a phrase and we're going to all try to show it with our bodies without saying it, like when you do charades. And if you want, if you want to have your mask on or off, it's okay. But facial expression and uh, some kind of a body gesture to show this phrase. So Ray is going to give us starting with some really easy ones, and we're all going to try to make a way to act that out, so that somebody who never heard that part before would be able to understand. Yeah. Okay. Did you guys get all that? Okay. So you guys are going to be acting out what I say. Um, the best to your ability. Hey, and if you know like sign language or anything, oh, that the yeah. coach explains sign language, I'd be even cooler. We have discussed that, but we haven't had time to learn sign language to go to or explain sign language yet. So, tell us, you start with this, this one oh. here. So tell us a phrase, and we'll try to show it with our body. Uh, okay, first phrase, Diane Ichanu. Show me Diane Ichanu. Do you want to tell your student Diane Ichanu? Diane Ichanu. Get the face as well, yeah? Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Interesting, okay. Uh huh. Uh, Hachitu. Hachitu, yeah. Hachitu. I'm not sure I would know what this one is. Uh, watch it. Watch it. Okay. Hachitu. Hachitu. Oh, Hachitu. 
Dog Joe. Dog Joe. Dog Joe. Dog Joe. Dog Joe. Yeah. There we go. All right. It took, uh -huh. English or 
sure that quote is fine. Yeah. Lower law quote is fine. So do it then away and show? Yeah, you can show. <laughs> then away. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. So, um, so you don't know because you don't know this language. So your only clue is what they're doing. So you're the only way they can know what it means. All right. Second one. Abris. 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 What does abris mean? Oh, all right. They did it. Good emotion. Abris means good job. They are channel. Huh. Okay. Third one. Shadjishte. 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 What does that mean? Shadjishte. Hachito. Hachito. Yeah. Hachito. Yeah. Ah, Diane Tanofi. Okay, one more, one more. This group is getting really good. <clears throat> in shoe. In shoe. In shoe. Do. What does in shoe mean? Do it. Do Can you understand what in shoe means based on their motion? <laughs> it means why. Don't get your mm. Why? Did you get that from their motions? Yeah. No. So this was a hard day in immersion school for you because you couldn't understand what the teacher was saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One more. Okay. This one you got to know. Chem ki did. Chem ki did. Aha. Okay. Okay. Diane chano piti damayagapi. Thank you. You can have a seat. Can we get three more volunteers to be our uh, immersion teachers? Three more volunteers, please. <laughs> People who are hiding in the back, can you take a turn? Uh, <clears throat> you'll have the answer from Rainy. Yeah. Yeah. Good. One. Yeah, come on. Great. Great. You guys need to be need to be gentle to these people. They're really taking a risk now. All right. Wait. Let me see where we are. Okay. Hima kidna. Hima kidna. Hima kidna. Hima kidna. What does it mean? Hima kidna. Hima kidna, what does it mean? Thinking. Think. <laughs> Confused. I know. I know. Okay. Okay. It means mona so dwaye. Now I know. Oh, now I know. Okay, we got close at the end there. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, wait. Yeah. Next one is ku anunat inche. Ku anunat inche. Who are not in here? Who are not in here? Okay, this one means Doket Anichiapeha. What is your name? What is your name? So, are you guys feeling a little frustration? Like, I'm showing you. <laughs> That's how it is in immersion, right? You feel frustrated, like, I'm showing you the meaning. But if they don't get it, they don't get it. They got no way to know, right? Just like you don't know Armenian, they don't know that quota, right? Okay, next one. <laughs> this is a good one. Gadu Machunim. Gadu machunim. Gadu machunim. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to. Gadu machunim. I don't speak. I don't speak. I don't speak. I 
don't lie. This one means I don't have a cat. Did you get that from what they were doing? <laughs> I thought that was very good. That was good, right? <laughs> cool. We got I don't something. People were onto I don't like something. Yeah. Okay. Um, hold on. I lost my place. Oh, yeah. Okay. Shun Maguzan. Shun Maguzan. Shun Maguzan. Dog something. Shun Maguzan comes to me. I have a dog. Shun Maguzan. So close. I bring. I bring a dog that's very close. I bring my dog. I want a dog. I want a dog. Show me all my chance. Okay. So dog was really clear for them. They got dog right away. It was the one thing that was a little hard to understand. Okay, maybe last one. <laughs> um, actually, let's just, let's skip that one. Let's skip that one. We had trouble with that one. Let's skip that one. Yes. Okay, wait until I find it. But Nestir. 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 Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Okay, yeah. Sit down. There we go. Pinamaya yabi. Pinamaya yabi. Jaya chalo. Okay, we're going to give a million dollars to all of you volunteers. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> okay, well, this was a, a goofy way of showing you what, what point, what, what problem. You are, are, I, I guarantee you you have a communication problem because they don't know even one word of the language you're speaking. So you have a 100% communication problem. Until you eliminate it through some kind of a cue, of course it's nice to have an image that you can show, a PowerPoint or something, and we do use those of course, because how, you know, what we were talking about um, in Dances with Wolves, how you can act out a Tatanka, but it's easier to just have a picture of <laughs> ready to go, <laughs> or a stuffed animal. But these, um, you have to think about these before you go into the lesson. You saw at the end of the course that people were able to say, you know, Wichina, um, Wichina, They learned that without any English. So how did we explain Wichina? How did we explain Wang? How did we explain Buduhe? All through those kind of motions, and acting it out, but it takes practice. And it's really hard for you as people who speak the language well to remember that they don't have any idea what you are saying. And they're not gonna figure it out by just repeating. You've gotta use your face, your body, which is very unnatural. And that's very not Dakota in my opinion. <laughs> Dakota people are like the opposite of Italians, right? No big gestures all the time, but you gotta practice have a teacher personality that you put on and take off <laughs> and then you can do a total immersion but it's really the key thing for immersion so it's good to, to try these out but also in my experience is to be consistent so if you have this or that one, make sure just to keep it that the whole time every time <laughs> or just keep your because sometimes they'll look at you and then you'll just have to do some movement and then they're gonna get the word. Like you don't even have to say it after a while. So it's really helpful just to keep those consistent every single time of what you decide means tat. <laughs> you know, this means tat. And um, just do that every single time you say tat. 
you know, and then pretty soon they'll associate the word with the action. And to this day, there's some Lakota words that I kind of have broken down into my brain. And I'll see the emotion of it, oh yeah, you know, it comes to me. So I have my own sign language, that's why this is easy. <laughs> Yeah, so you saw in the video when they were reaching the end of the course that they still did a lot of the motions with us and they did the motions with the other, like like one person is listening to another student answer the question, but they're doing the motion with the student. And so what Rainey's saying is exactly right. It embeds in your brain better if there's a motion to go with it. And, and also it helped, there's a thing with your brain where it goes two ways. So if you say, oh, chante mashiche, chante mashiche, you learn it like this. If you can't remember that word, but you make this motion, it comes back to you. Uh, this chante uh, chante It comes back because your brain says, "Oh, I know what goes with that." So it really helps them, and we we kind of pressure them pretty hard the first day that we start doing motions that they have to do the motions too, and they're like, "That's weird. I don't want to." It's really worth it. It's really worth it. Yeah, that's how it is, right? They're listening to the words and they're trying to get something out of that word, but they're not gonna. I know they're not gonna get it because I didn't teach it to them yet. So there's no way for them to know what host mysteries means. They, we, I can yell host mysteries at them until we all pass away. They're not gonna figure it out. They need some kind of a clue, right? So, okay, well, we wanted to just wrap this up. Congratulations, you survived a very awkward workshop. <laughs> Uh, by just telling you like what we think the strongest, strongest points of this course for absolute beginners are and um, you know the persistent weaknesses or issues that come up also because always a work in progress and teaching language as you all know is very hard and uh, then we have just time for questions so um, I forget who's supposed to say you got a plan, got to be prepared. <laughs> so I think the biggest successes of the Life Jacket course model is that every single student we have speaks in the language, including the ones who speak wrong every single time, and they really struggle. They speak, they open their mouth, and they try. And as you were saying earlier, putting those sounds in your mouth, it's key. You're not just gonna magically be able to say those sounds after listening for a long time. You have to practice, get your muscles going. It's hard, and so every single one of them does do that. We've had total success with that. Of course, some people don't, don't finish the course after the first day, but to be honest, we found that that's the case in every class, no matter how we teach, um, and it's about the same, no matter what methods we use, so we haven't noticed that anyone didn't continue because of the methods. And we have noticed the opposite, that many of them love the methods and want to keep going. So, so everyone speaks is a huge victory. And we said that they may not be correct, but they are creative. So they don't always get the grammar right because they've literally heard this language for less than 15 hours in their entire lives. But they do try and they recombine the phrases that they know we saw the ransom note that was my favorite example. But they try, and so, um, for example, we had taught them, um, we taught them some nouns on the first day, or second day maybe, and one was uh, question. And then the next day we taught them and as soon as one of the students learned I have, she said, Right away, she reused it in a way we didn't teach her. And then she said, mini sota, mini sota, mini, 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 sota, sota. So she's asking on her second day of class, what does mini sota mean in Dakota? She knows it's a Dakota word, she knows what mini means, because we showed her. So she wants to know what sota means. Bit of a tough question for day two. But that's creative use, and that's what we want to see, that they, they figure out a way from whatever they do know, 
to say what they want to say, even if that's not the right way, but we understand. And they laugh. <laughs> they laugh a lot. Uh, we laugh a lot. Um, but not at, any, not at anybody, not in a bad way. We laugh together and everybody supports each other and we have um, a really positive atmosphere. We think that's a really big victory because like Raina was saying, when you try to learn a language, any language is very vulnerable and sensitive. People feel very insecure. Also, we feel when we're trying to teach, especially me, it's not my language, I feel extremely insecure. Um, but we all just laugh and do our best and they love that and so they keep coming back. And <clears throat> of course, the most important one is that they actually experience themselves as successful. They, they live an experience which most of them have never lived in their French class or their Spanish class, which is I go to class and I come home and I can do things I couldn't do before in the language. <clears throat> Not, I know a list of words, not I passed a test, not I know how to conjugate the past subjunctive, but I can do something in this language. Watch me, I can do it. I can talk to someone. They need more people to talk with, of course. But that feeling of experience, uh, that they were successful is what keeps them going. So those are really positive points. Now for the troubles, <laughs> do you wanna discuss? So, some of you might say, well, it's not very about what this is like that. <laughs> We're very stoic people. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I agree, you know, and, um, but also, uh, that's true, but also, I put myself out there to, to, to teach language, to make it exciting, to make it fun because I have to compete with YouTube, I have to compete with Fortnite, I have to compete with all these other things because we're just inundated with media and everything else, right? I mean, we don't live stoically, <laughs> we laugh, you know? This is part of our, who we are too, is laughing through the hard stuff, so. I think you have to change this and make it your own, and that's like the whole plan and everything. Like, I, um, I've taken this and made it my own, with my own flavor. Now you have to do it with your own flavor. And however that may be, you know, maybe your sense of humor is like totally different. Well, use that. Use, find your strength and go with it. Um, so whatever that is, whatever your strength is, just identify it and go with it and make this plan your own. I think that's probably one of the, most, the main things that I want to say. Um, this is just a plan. It's like a skeleton. You fill in all the, the flash and the meat and everything to it. Um, and then school training. Like they know how to do school and then we don't do it that way. Right. So a lot of times people are just, they want to take notes. They want to write it down. Oh, how do you spell that? Wait, hold on. What, what, what's the meaning of that again? Or, you know, no, they don't, they don't want to use it. Um, a lot of, you know, when people come to America and they speak a foreign language, they don't come to America and say, can you read and write and take the uh, notes in English? They say, can you speak English? So I think this is the difference is getting people out of that comfort zone of speaking. And I think sometimes notes is kind of a, um, a scapegoat. Like if I take really good notes, then I don't have to talk. <laughs> so it's just challenging yourself because when you push yourself outside of that comfort zone, that's where growth happens. So um, just keep that in mind for your students. And I think of myself as part motivational speaker because we're giving beginner, beginner um, lessons. So these are people just on their journey of learning language. I don't want to crush them. <laughs> I want to make it fun. I want to be like, wow, learning that voice is really fun. <laughs> And hopefully they'll have like fun teachers after me. <laughs> That's just my hope. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I would say when I first started learning Lakota for myself, because I had been around it, you know, I heard both Lakota and Dakota, so I was like, yeah, I know stuff. 
And that was good for like the first few classes. And I, I would probably read myself on a scale of one to 10, like five. I mean, now it's like six years later, I'm probably like a, a two. <laughs> just because the, <laughs> the more language I learn, just the more it blows my mind. I'm like, wow, this language is so efficient and complex and beautiful, you know? <laughs> but you know, a lot of times people really think that they know more than they actually do. And a lot of times, but then, you have a lot of things in your toolbox. So let's say you have a lot of words in your toolbox. So then you start learning how to put these words together into sentences and then you're like, you get more advanced the more you learn how to use words <coughs> and phrases rather than just single words. So I think that's the, um, the benefit. It's, um, now you, can, you know what this word means, so now you can add it in a different context. Um, and then the different levels, okay, so. I'm a very slow learner. Like, I've taken linguistics probably five times. I've taken many Dakota One classes. I've just been, I mean, I think in the early 2000s, my Tumi really inspired me to start learning Dakota, but it took me a long time to actually step into to start learning it. And then I did, and I would be sitting next to a very, like, young learner, you know, student, 18 years old, and I'm like, Let's see what I was like, 35 or something. And he's just picking it up like this. <laughs> like it, he's just like going, you know, learning every phrase, everything, and I'm just stumbling through things, just trying to remember things. But you see, he has an advantage because he can go home after class and he can study language, make flashcards, talk with his friends. I have to go home, I have to make dinner, do laundry. <laughs> you know, that's a different. Um, different life path. So us sitting in a class together, our levels may be different. But you see, I have a different strength. Because what I know, I really know. <laughs> like, it's a different strength. So you just have to find where your, your strength is. So being a slow learner isn't a bad thing. Because for me, it just made me uh, know more what it was. Made me sure of what I know. <laughs> Yeah, and among the students that we have, there's always someone who's like racing ahead after the first lesson. They've got it, they're moving on to the next thing. And then there's always someone who on day five is still struggling with what we learned on day one. It always happens. And that's for the reasons we've said, it's natural, it's human nature. And so we just naturally adjust, we just naturally um, give, you know, have the, the folks who are a little stronger do an example. Um, and when we get to that person who we know is struggling, we try to ask them more things we know that are familiar for them, give them a chance to be successful, we give them more reminders. So we don't let anybody fail. And the ones who are really moving quickly, we do sometimes give them extra things that they can learn outside of class to satisfy that desire if they're spending four hours a day studying or something. It's like, well, not everybody can do that. So we give them some things that they could look at online or whatever. Um, but we, but they still all benefit together and they still all help each other by, by keeping it conversational. So it works out. Any, yeah, time for questions. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll let you talk into the mic because there's so many people here. I don't see those here. Hi, Belinda Bejo Rencounter. I'm a great grandmother from Dakota Crow Creek, and I've heard uh, Oyate people say that we are born with our language, it's in our DNA. And because of all the trauma that we went through, that we need to give ourselves permission to remember our language not necessarily learn it or relearn, but to remember. And I found from experience that going into like Inipi and Wakayosha, the children are come in there for the first time, they already know the songs. They, it's just natural. So there, there are different ways to look at our beautiful language, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Dene, um, Philippines, 
Um, at my school at Crow Creek Tribal Elementary, we have some Filipino uh, we are ladies who come from their country and they're teaching us their happy birthday song in their language and our students just picked it up. So I always wonder how can it be that um, relatives from another country, they just pick up our language real quick, but some of us it takes years to remember. I'm, I'm still studying that, um, something that's not explainable real easily. They just they just pick it up. Do you have any um, answers to that or any suggestions? Um, I'm gonna let Rainy speak about the Dakota aspect of that and then I can speak about the brain aspect of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, so sometimes it does get discouraging because I'm a poor learner, sometimes that Dakota but you know, one thing I, know, I observed too, because I'm trying to figure the same thing out. Um, but one thing I've observed is like all the Dakota language classes or the culture classes I've taken, at some point somebody gets up and walks out in tears, you know? This is one thing I noticed. I mean, every class I've had, you know, it gets emotional sometimes. I mean, there's times when we're all crying, <laughs> when we're all with Dakota people, because. Like it's somewhere in here, you know, like you feel it. Um, it's close to us. It's, it's um, cherished. We always say we cherish the language and we cherish it. And so um, sometimes we're just like, like really protective of that too, you know. So it took me a long time to be like, um, I only want to teach Dakota people. When all the Dakota people learn Dakota, then I'm going to teach non Dakota, <laughs> you know. But then also I've seen the help of like allies, you know, and plus, you know, she wants to learn because she's on the Dakota country. You know, this is, everybody should be learning. My cousin said that everybody should be learning the language. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess so. You know, but it only helps us and makes us stronger. And two, sometimes you can take that negative feeling. Um, there's a really wonderful teacher who was one of my daughter's immersion school teachers, um, Dakota teachers. And um, she was, she's really great with the language. and. One time I seen her just conversing with like fluent elders and I was so jealous. I was like, oh, she's not even Dakota. <laughs> and, um, and at first I used that energy to, um, and memorization and, 
and those kind of things, which is what they were taught, and they tried their best. But the, the stuff that we've known since at least the 70s in the research, and to be honest, which stuff what do people always knew before colonization and the way that they always practiced education, is not being used in, the, in those programs. And so that's why we were talking today about those four Fs, <coughs> function, form, frequency, feedback. That's the basis of how the brain learns. If your Spanish teacher or whatever in high school didn't, didn't use those, those methods and backwards planning, then you didn't learn very much Spanish. You didn't walk away as a speaker of Spanish. But you could have in that time. Now, with Uh, yeah, I don't think we're disagreeing. I think that the training that's offered doesn't lead them to be effective, but many people have a natural gift, and they go off of the training, and they do it better. So I'm just saying I don't blame any teacher for us all not knowing Spanish or German or whatever, but we just have to recognize that there's a lot of methods people are using that don't really work. They don't work for our brain. Now, learning Dakota is not like learning Spanish, because you can't just fly somewhere and have it all around you all day, every day, so it's much harder but the same methods will help you be more effective. So a lot of people believe that they themselves as an individual are bad at language. I always tell people I work with language teachers and then every single person I ever talk to says, oh, I'm bad at language. How can every single person be bad at language? They're not bad at language, they just didn't have the kind of teaching that worked for them. So that's how we hope to change that. So it does take a long time, it is hard, it's really, really hard. But it's not impossible, and people are not stupid. They're not bad at language. They just didn't have the kind of teaching that they needed. That's what I would say. That's just me speaking about my own, my own people of language, <laughs> language teachers. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, if you have the language at home, that's a huge blessing for you and you should definitely take advantage. I think most people though, they don't have the ability to have it at home. Maybe, maybe I think most, at least some people do not have it in their family. And so that puts the burden back on the teachers. And you guys as language teachers, I think you have, um, I, I think you have an extremely, extremely difficult job because you're supposed to be inside a school or a community center, and you're supposed to make up for what doesn't happen at home. Whether because people don't want to speak or they can't speak, same difference, it doesn't get spoken at home. And you're supposed to make up for that in 45 minutes or <laughs> 20 minutes or an hour. That's an impossible job. That's an impossible assignment that you've been given. But these methods we think mimic what would happen at home closely just to try to get the most out of your time. But the truth is, there's no replacement for speaking with your grandma or your mom. I mean, no one can replace that. No teacher can can produce that. And and that's part of the tragedy that has happened with Dakota language. But it's about trying to make the best of the time that you do have, I think. Yeah, and then I'll I'd like to share with, with the Kushi, the Uchi, about um, how proud I am to be called Kushi. Like if we're at Walmart, most of my Hakoja who are around me, they call me Kushi. So at Walmart, if someone says Kushi, I know that's me. Because if you say grandma, everybody's looking, you know? That's what I found about the beauty of our language. It's, it, it connects us, especially with our young people, with, with the language. So even a, a simple term like that has a lot of meaning. So I just want to encourage everyone to keep going, keep going. Watch uh, heat, Maybe Maybe it might get hard, and you might want to give up. Keep going. I agree with you. I always tell my kids, my little ones, everybody's my grandchild, and I tell them I'm pushing. Only 
their mother or their father's mom is ma kushi, because ma kushi is a preposition. So I told am kushi, grandmother, everybody's grandmother. But I tell them to use it in the proper context so they don't get confused when they go to school and start writing English. But anyways, I think I'm just going to say something that I grew up with. I grew up a full-blooded Stoney, speaking Stoney, very fluent, no word of English when I started school. And uh, I had to learn how to speak English at school. But at home, everybody was fluent in Stoney, so we just kept our Stoney up. And uh, so, but as generations grew and as we started our families and everything, some of us weren't as consistent with that language and our children start to dwindle out of the language. But if you teach them from the beginning, they still remember. Because as my children are going past 40, going into 50, they're back to Stony. So I know that it stays in the brain. It starts when they're small. But when we were children, uh, we were gonna be laughed at a lot if we spoke Stony at school. They were gonna laugh at you. They, you know, you're gonna get a strap. So there was a lot of terrorizing in our, our uh, you know, parents uh, mentoring us to be accepted in school. So that kind of influenced throwing away that language that's going to cause a trauma, hurt. And I guess a lot of it, a lot of them walked away from the language, but those that still spoke it at home stayed with them. But that, those are some of the hindrances that stop people from speaking their language as they grew older. And it was true too, because you got a strap or a ruler if you spoke your, your language at school. But we, because we were obedient, we just didn't see too much of that. But those are some of the things that hindered people from keeping their language. I just wanted to share that with you from where we come in. I just want to share something here. Uh, I know there's some, uh, we have people in here from most of the reservations. We have, uh, I believe uh, there's Pine Ridge, uh, Shang River, Stang Rock, Oak Creek, Low Blue, Mississippi, and our Pakish Lakota at one day new school. And, we have uh, some parents one night, and they were talking about uh, the Lakota language. And Pine Ridge has more Lakota speakers. And, and, uh, and then, next one is Rosebud. And then the third one is Cheyenne River. And the fourth one is Standing Rock. And then there's Crow Creek. And then, uh, with all due respect to the Kokri young lady here, he said there's only one or two speakers in Kokri. Low brew, nothing. It's just about zero. And Sisseton, there's only one, and he's my brother, but he's not there anymore. So there's no speakers over there at all. So the language is going down pretty fast. If we don't start talking Lakota to our grandchildren, within the next few years, there will be no Lakota speakers. So always remember that. So that's all I'm going to share. It's bad news, but we all need to just keep going. We, have a, we can do it. I've been teaching kids at Monday uh, Knee for the last 12 years, and I get to see one fluent speaker because I'm going to have them for like 20 minutes each day for four days, and that's not enough. And then when they go home, the parents do not speak Lakota. And I think that's where it's, they need to learn to. Kalamahato, Ayavinahe, Washicha, Sita, Takoma, Nihecha, Tua. I 
us to, um, we're from uh, Canada, Alberta. Uh, there's 30% I speak fluently at home for us. And um, I do recall, I remember, I must have been three years old before I went to school. We were told uh, not to say where you're from. They told us not to talk to, uh, say where we are from. That was kind of a secret in the nation, in our nation. We weren't allowed to talk to anyone outside the community. But there were a little bit around, around, you know, white nation, whatever. But we had our language. That was good. We were all fluent speakers. Um, that was in 1958. We were fluent. Everybody was fluent. The kids were fluent. We didn't understand English. And now, uh, my co worker and I, and a part of the heritage back home, the community itself is trying to revive the language. And we're doing our best because us now, the ones that are fluent, there's still the percentage there. We're trying our best to keep the language. I find that um, our community, some don't want to have nothing to do with it, while others, they want to. And some are arrogant to say, that's not my language. I don't want to use it, attitude. And it's, we fight with that at the school. And, you know, parents don't want them to learn. You know, the ones that are, the ones that are, didn't want to have nothing to do with it. And this is something that's very important. And I do agree, I'm guilty at that for putting English into our stoning. You know, I add English in there, even though I know the word. I'm just lazy to say it, and that's really bad. Like, in, like I'm fluent. And when you, we start cutting short on the speaking part, you know, all they need to know is three word language. As a, as a language teacher back home, been with the school and the heritage department for so long. I too want to keep our language going, and it's a, it's really frustrating at most times because we have the conflict in our community today that that's not how it is said, and um, some like you know there's a clan difference in different you know northwest of the reserve you know north there's a clan difference and the pronunciation is different. We have that conflict. The West End people say mashte, rabbit. The East End people say mashtian. So we have to add that in the dictionary and we have a dictionary. And then, but we understand it. So we kept that going. And now we have that conflict of saying, oh, when they go into the dictionary app, they say, oh, we're to blame, because Eugene and I are the ones that are, I put the, dictionary, the words in the dictionary and modify them and, and uh, everything like that. And Eugene, you know, he does the spelling too, like if we all have me. It's a conflict and it's hard to, you know, I mean, get real. We don't want to lose our language, don't matter how you say it, but as long as you remember the word. We're, going through that and it's very hard, but we still continue. Like the uh, Gua, Louise and I, Louise did the head start and Eugene and I at the Heritage Department. And, and there's a daycare that, you know, that one too. That's the language every now and then. We are trying and hopefully we will succeed eventually what I did to teach them at the time, being a teacher, I know I'm no longer there, but I still work in that department. I taught them conversation. I watched it. I I just wrote it down. I watched it. Look 
Good day, how are you? And then I have answers here. Ta'awot, I'm doing fine. Mahmat, I'm sleepy. Ta'amish, uh, Timashi, I didn't sleep good last night. Hakin uh, Wagita, I got up early. Look, things like that, to answer back to me, and vice versa, right? And I kept that going, and we got kinship, everything, animals. What kind of animal do you like eating? I like elk meat. I like elk meat. So they will have the answer out there. They will ask that answer themselves. What did you shoot? What did you kill? I shot a moose. Those kinds of answers. I created the conversation into the curriculum, and that's what I'm doing now. And we're doing on Zoom online with the kids and adults out there now. These conversations, you will remember, because beforehand, they were picking it up, but as you put the conversation answer and you know vice versa, make them ask the questions, vice versa, they will keep that. And um, they're starting to use it now. So just a thought and just something to think about. Thank you.